welcome back to the course on uh, computer networks and uh, internet protocol. So, in the last classes we have looked into various services uh, in um, transport layer of the protocol stack and uh, we have looked into in details the connection establishment and the connection termination procedure. So, today we will look into the second services which is uh, the uh, flow control and the reliability in uh, transport layer. So, uh, the flow control and uh, reliability ensures that whenever you have established certain end to end connection between the two remote hosts. So, on top of that connection now you need to send the sequence of data bits. So, uh, in transport layer in TCP kind of protocol you send it uh, in the form of sequence of bytes. Uh, on the other hand in certain version of transport protocols the uh, data is transmitted in the form of sequence of packets or sequence of uh, segments. So, uh, in uh, this uh, end to end connection which is being established on the two end of the devices the two end devices uh, here our objective is the first objective is that the sender should not send more data uh, compared to what the receiver can receive. So, this particular methodology or this particular philosophy we call it as a flow control algorithm. So, the flow control algorithm ensures that the sender is always aware about what the receiver can receive or how much data the receiver can receive and accordingly the sender adjusted uh, its rate of transmission such that uh, it does not overshoot the rate at which the receiver can receive. At the same time uh, as we have discussed earlier that uh, the lower layer of the protocol stack uh, is kind of unreliable. So, whenever the network layer forwards packets or forwards data to an remote host the network layer does not ensure that um, there is a kind of uh, guarantee or uh, assurance that your data will be delivered at the other end. So, it makes a base try to deliver your data. Uh, based on your destination address and finding out the intermediate hops through which the packet need to be delivered. But uh, on the other hand um, this uh, network layer it does not bother about that um, how much data need to be pushed to the network or how much data need to be transferred and as a result what happens in a packet switching network that I described uh, in the last class that the intermediate buffers at the intermediate network devices like the routers they may get filled up and you may experience a buffer overflow from those intermediate routers. And because of that uh, whenever you are delivering a data through this uh, network layer uh, using the IP delivery method there is always a possibility that a considerable number of data frames or data uh, segments they are getting dropped uh, from the uh, from the network layer. Now, the task of the transport layer is to consider that to find out or to sense whether certain data has been transferred correctly at the other end or not. And if it is not transferred at the other end correctly, then apply this reliability mechanism to ensure that every message which is sent by the application layer, layer that is getting delivered at the other end uh, eventually. So, uh, the broad idea is that you sense the channel, you sense the media to find out uh, whether the data is uh, being transmitted correctly or not. If the data is not being transmitted correctly that means the other end is not able to receive the data. If you are able to find it out then retransmit the data uh, to make sure that eventually the data is uh, received by the other end receiver. Now, uh, in a typical transport layer this flow control and reliability are implemented together. So, we will look into the different mechanism through which we implement the flow control and the reliability algorithm so far the transport layer of a TCP IP protocol stack. So, let us proceed with the detail mechanism of that one. So, uh, this is the broad idea of uh, ensuring reliability. So, as I have mentioned that uh, your network layer uh, provides you an unreliable channel. So, the network layer does not guarantee that um, the packet that it is trying to deliver at the other end it will be eventually uh, transmitted. So, there is always a possibility of buffer overflow from the intermediate routers because of which there is a possibility of uh, data loss. Now, uh, we are we are having some hypothetical function or hypothetical method which is um, through which we are uh, making an interaction among different layers uh, to make you understand about the entire procedure. Now, if you just think about uh, from the application perspective, the application always wants or the application always um, 
try to have one methodology through which uh, you will be able to ensure reliability. So, that means the application always wants that uh, if a sender is or a sending process is sending certain message or certain data that data will be eventually received by the receiver. So, the receiver will receive all the messages. So, you can just think of an application like a file transfer. So, the entire large file is divided into multiple chunks and then the sender processes sending the data bits for that file. Now, at the receiver end you need to ensure that all the data that is sent by the sender that is received eventually otherwise you will not be able to reconstruct the entire file. So, that is why from the application perspective reliability is utmost importance uh, for uh, many of the application, but as I have mentioned earlier there, there exists a certain group of applications where reliability uh, is not that much important rather uh, delivering the data or delivering the message is more important uh, within a uh, predefined timeout duration and in that case we use UDP type of protocols where reliability is not a concern or reliability is not used. But for the application for the set of applications when reliability is a concern uh, during that time the application always expects that the data or the messages that that is transferred from the application, they will be eventually received at the receiver side. Now, the application here expects a reliable channel. So, the question comes that your network layer is unreliable. So, on this unreliable channel, how can you express or how can you write a methodology to ensure reliability? So, the idea is there that at the transport layer, you have this reliable data transfer protocol at the sender side and the receiver side. So, uh, this uh, uh, sending sending process at the uh, network layer it is uh, unreliable uh, send UDT send that uh, express the unreliable uh, way of sending the data on top of that you are implementing this reliability mechanism which is ensuring that reliable uh, data send uh, on top of the transport layer. So, whenever you are making an interfacing between the network layer and the transport layer, there you have this um, unreliable data sent uh, and uh, at the interface of transport layer and the application layer, you have the interface um, of uh, reliable data sent. Now, at the other end, uh, it receives the data in a reliable way because of this reliable data send mechanism which is there and uh, this reliable data transfer protocol at the receiver side eventually it will receive the message and it will deliver the data to the application layer. So, that way uh, the application layer will always expect a reliable delivery of the messages and here we will see that in the transport layer how can you implement these two mechanism at the sender side and at the receiver side which will help you uh, to ensure reliability in the system. So, let us look into this process in details. Uh, so, uh, as I uh, uh, as I discussed uh, earlier uh, during the discussion of uh, different layer of the TCP IP protocol stack that certain services are implemented in multiple layers of the protocol stack. So, this flow control and error control these are the two mechanism which are implemented both at the transport layer and the data link layer. So, the question comes that uh, why do we need to implement flow control at the transport layer as well as the data link layer. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you if you just ask the question in this way that let us assume that uh, I have my uh, flow control algorithm in the data link layer which is being implemented, do I need to have the flow control al algorithm at the transport layer itself. So, let us look into one example where uh, you have this flow control algorithm at the data link layer. So, the data link layer ensures this hop by hop flow control algorithm. So, as we have learned uh, already that uh, your data link layer protocol uh, it ensures the hop by hop uh, principles the hop by hop uh, transmission of data whereas the transport layer it ensures the complete end to end delivery of the data. Now, whenever we are saying that the flow control algorithm is implemented at the data link layer uh, it is like that this hop by hop flow controls are implemented. So, if you think about this as the intermediate routers R1, R2 and R3 and this is the source and this is the final destination. So, this um, flow control algorithm at the data link layer it ensures that you have flow control mechanism between S and R1, R1 between R1 and R2, between R2 and R3 and between R3 and D. Now, so, this hop by hop flow control algorithms are there. Now, the question comes if I have this hop by hop flow control algorithm, do I still need, still need to have a, a flow control algorithm at the transport layer. Now, 
just uh, think of a scenario that well this link from S to R1 it is 10 Mbps, the link from R1 to R2 it is 5 Mbps, the links from R2 to R3 it is 3 Mbps and the link from R3 to uh, this D this is 1 Mbps. Now, what happens here that whenever you are implementing this uh, hop by hop flow control at the data link layer, then from S to R1, the S finds out that well I can send the data at a rate of 10 Mbps. So, it sends the data at a rate of 10 Mbps. But then R1 finds out that it will not be able to send the data to R2 at a rate of 10 Mbps, although it is receiving the data at a rate of 10 Mbps, but it requires 5 Mbps of transmission. Similarly, R2 it finds out that it will not be able to send data at a rate of 5 Mbps rather it need to send the data at 3 Mbps and finally, from R3 to D it can only send the data at a rate of 1 Mbps. Now, if S does not know that this entire, so if you look into the uh, effective rate of this entire end to end path, uh, so this effective rate of this entire end to end path will be equal to 1 Mbps. Now, if S does not get this information, S will try to push the data at a rate of 10 Mbps and what will happen that R1 will not be able to deliver the data to uh, R2 and so on. So, that way that additional data which is coming to R1, so R1 is receiving the data at a rate of 10 Mbps, but it is only able to deliver the data at a rate of 5 Mbps. So, that uh, as a result this additional data that it is receiving it will get on filling up the buffer space which is available at R1. And eventually what will happen that eventually you will experience the data loss from the buffer due to buffer overflow. So, there will be a huge amount of data loss because source is transmitting data at a rate of 10 Mbps, but the receiver the other end receiver is only able to receive data at a rate of 1 Mbps. And as a result this 9 Mbps of data that will get accumulated over the uh, different layers of uh, buffers at different intermediate routers and after some time it will experience a drop of data from those intermediate buffers. And this is the reason that we are not able to implement, uh, uh, if we implement this um, flow control algorithm only at the data link layer for hop by hop flow control it is not sufficient, we have to implement it at the transport layer. Now, let us look into the other way around like you have this end to end flow control algorithm uh, and in that case still we do, still we um, require uh, that uh, this flow control algorithm at data link layer or not. Now, in transport layer what happens that you are only ensuring the end to end uh, data delivery or end to end flow control algorithm. So, you have uh, one router with which your source is getting connected, then you have this intermediate network, then another router and then your destination which is there. And you are only ensuring the flow control among these two end hosts and just think about the earlier example that uh, you are sending data at a rate of 1 Mbps. Now, you just think of two intermediate routers here in the network. Now, this router has multiple incoming ports. So, it is just like a road network that you are getting data from uh, multiple uh, parts altogether. So, uh, you are getting data from this link, you are getting data from this link, you are getting data from this link and so on. So, that way uh, it may happen that this link is pushing data at a rate of 1 Mbps, but this individual links may push data at a rate of 2 Mbps and say this link is pushing data at a rate of 5 Mbps. But this outgoing link it only has a speed of say 3 Mbps. In that case, because this multiple incoming link are getting converged in an intermediate router, uh, it may happen that the total incoming rate which is being there from multiple others incoming links that is uh, exceeding the total outgoing capacity that the router has. And because of that, uh, this end to end um, uh, flow control algorithm. Uh, it may perform poorly in this kind of scenario. So, that is why to make it control to have a control uh, you need the uh, hop by hop flow control uh, mechanism in the network. But here you will see by applying this hop by hop flow control algorithm in the network. Uh, so, what uh, your task could be your task could be to reduce the uh, incoming rate at uh, every individual hop such that intermediate routers is uh, experience less congestion, less amount of congestion. 
So, by doing that you are effectively improving the performance of the system, but uh, remember that by uh, even after implementing the hub by hub flow control it may not be possible to um, uh, possible to ensure complete um, reliability that uh, complete elimination of data loss, because you are receiving data from multiple hops and everywhere there is a kind of estimation going on that what should be the ideal rate at which the one end should send the data at the other end. And uh, this estimation takes some, some time. So, before the system moves to the convergence there is always a possibility of having a significant amount of data loss. So, you will not be able to completely eliminate the data loss by applying this um, uh, hop by hop flow control mechanism, but certainly you can improve the performance. And that is the reason we say that uh, flow control mechanism the error control we will discuss later on. The flow control and this error control mechanism at the transport layer they are essential, whereas the flow control and the error control mechanism at the data link layer they improve the performance of your protocol. Now, let us look into uh, uh, different type of uh, flow control algorithms and before going to that why we do uh, why do we require this different kind of end to end uh, uh, protocols in the network. So, for that I suggest all of you to read through this uh, particular paper uh, which was pro, uh, which was uh, published by Solger, Reed and Clark. Uh, so, it is a fundamental paper in uh, computer networking that talks about that why do you require this kind of end to end protocols in the internet when there is this hub by hub protocols already existing. So, I suggest all of you to read uh, this particular paper to uh, get uh, more details about uh, the principles which were adapted in the TCP IP protocol stack to implement this kind of uh, end to end protocols over the internet. Now, uh, let us look into this flow control algorithms. So, the simplest flow control algorithm that we have, we call it as a stop and wait flow control algorithm. So, the stop and wait flow control algorithm in a error free channel works as follows. The protocol is pretty simple that uh, you send the frame or you send the packet and then you wait for its acknowledgement. So, once the receiver receives this frame, it sends back an acknowledgement and the sender it waits for the acknowledgement before sending the next frame or the next packet. So, once you are receiving this acknowledgement then you only send the next frame. So, that way every frame has an acknowledgement associated with it and only when you receive the acknowledgement you transmit the next frame. Now, if it is a error free channel it is always um, guaranteed that eventually the receiver will receive the frame and it will be able to send you back the acknowledgement and the sender will eventually receive the acknowledgement because it is an error free channel and uh, there is no loss. Uh, so, uh, once you are receiving the acknowledgement you are sure that the receiver has received this particular uh, frame and so uh, you transmit the next frame. So, that is the broad idea of this stop and wait protocol. So, you stop uh, uh, after sending transmission start sending the next frame after sending one frame then wait for the acknowledgement. When you have received the wait then you send the next frame. Now, let us look into this flow control algorithm in a noisy channel the same stop and wait protocol. So, here uh, we use the concept of sequence numbers to individually identify each frame and the corresponding acknowledgement. So, every frame is associated with um, uh, one sequence number. So, if you look into this example this uh, frame 0 is associated with um, a sequence number. Uh, so, this 0 is the sequence number for this frame and then we are uh, getting an acknowledgement. So, this acknowledgement mechanism uh, it is sending acknowledgement 1 it is sending acknowledgement 1 means that B has correctly received frame 0 and then it is expecting for frame 1. So, then you send the frame 1. So, once you have B has received frame 1 then it sends acknowledge 0 that means uh, B has received frame 1 and it is waiting for the acknowledgement 0. So, that way uh, in a noisy channel the first uh, reason is the first principle is that you separate out every frame uh, with by using the uh, corresponding sequence number which will be uniquely identify every frame in the uh, channel. Now, uh, because it is a noisy channel there is a possibility of having a frame loss uh, because this frame is uh, being lost from the network. So, if there is a frame loss so B will not send back any acknowledgement. So, you wait for a timeout value. So, A will wait for a timeout value and once this timeout expires then A will retransmit the frame. Now, one interesting question here is that what can be the maximum size of the sequence number in stop and wait. So, in stop and wait you can see that at one instance of time only one frame can be outstanding in the network. So, whenever you have sent frame 0 unless you are getting the acknowledgement from that frame you will not send the next frame. 
So that is why 2 bit sequence number will be sufficient and uh, because of this reason you can see from this diagram that uh, every frame is associated with one sequence number and the sequence numbers are zeros and ones. So, repeated zeros and ones. So, that means whenever you have seen frame 0, unless you are getting this acknowledgement with the expected frame 1, you will not send frame 1. So, uh, you can always be sure uh, by looking at the acknowledgement that which uh, uh, for which frame uh, this uh, acknowledgement corresponds to. If you are getting an acknowledgement 1, that means you have correctly received frame 0 and you are expecting from uh, for, 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 for frame 1. Uh, so, uh, that is uh, uh, the reason that we use 2 bit sequence number for uh, this flow control algorithm using stop and wait. And this kind of algorithm where uh, we are utilizing the concept of sequence number and uh, applying flow control algorithm uh, in case of a uh, noisy channel. And you can see that by applying this flow control algorithm in a noisy channel, we are also ensuring reliability in the system. So, we are also ensuring that the receiver receives all the frames correctly. So, if there are uh, if a timeout occurs, then you retransmit that frame again. So, that this frame 0 eventually receives by the receiver B. So, that way uh, you are also ensuring reliability in the system and this flow control and reliability algorithm altogether, we call it as a automated repeat request or ARQ algorithms. So, now onwards we will look into this ARQ algorithms in details, the different versions or the different variants of uh, ARQ algorithms. Well, um, so this is a kind of sender side implementation of um, uh, this top and weight ARQ algorithm in the form of a state transition diagram. So, here um, the thing is that uh, this you can think of the initial state. So, the initial state um, talks about that you wait for uh, call 0 from above that means you are waiting for frame 0 initially. Uh, so, the event uh, which is there, it is uh, in the sender side. So, you are you are uh, from the application layer, you are uh, sending a reliable uh, data delivery. Now, uh, once this um, uh, things happen, so at the uh, transport layer side, you are making a call to reliable data delivery to send with this data. Now, how it ensures the reliable data delivery? So, you need to map this RDT to the corresponding UDT call because if you remember that earlier we have seen that uh, at the network layer the calls are unreliable calls like this UDT calls. So, for that uh, what you are doing that you are appending one sequence number with this uh, packet, uh, you are providing the data and some checksum, checksum we will discuss later on to ensure the uh, error free transmission of the data. Then you are sending the data over unreliable channel and starting the timer. Now, whenever you are waiting for the acknowledgement 0, you are moving to the state that you have sent uh, the package 0. So, you are waiting for the corresponding acknowledgement. So, here uh, once you are receiving a packet and if you are finding out that the packet is corrupted and uh, in that case you are in the same loop, you again wait for an acknowledgement. If a timeout occurs, then again you send the packet, uh, you retransmit the packet through this UDT send mechanism, you retransmit the packet and start the timer again. And then once you are receiving the acknowledgement, then you move to this state that wait for call 1 because you have received that acknowledgement, now you want to send the next frame that is frame 1. So, in that case you have uh, received the packet from the upper layer and uh, once you have received that packet and that packet is not a, a corrupted packet and uh, it is the acknowledgement corresponds to uh, frame 0. So, you are moving to this state once the, you are in this state in that case you are uh, waiting for receiving the packet from the upper layer. So, once you have received the packet from the upper layer then you make this send call um, with the data with this frame 0 and the same process gets repeated that you append this sequence number sequence number 1 uh, along with the data and the corresponding checksum and then send the packet through the uh, unreliable channel and you move for waiting for that corresponding acknowledgement. And the same process gets repeated that uh, uh, if you are receiving the data and the packet is corrupted, you are in this loop. Uh, if a timeout occurs, then you transmit the packet again and start the timer again and then whenever you are receiving the acknowledgement, that means you are receiving a non-corrupted packet and you have received the acknowledgement uh, corresponds to frame 1, then um, you stop the timer and wait for um, this uh, frame 0. So, that way you um, send these frames one after another frame zeros and frame 1s one after another and you uh, 
uh, move through this uh, uh, state transition diagram to send the packets one after another and ensure proper flow control along with uh, the reliability in the system. Well, so let us look into the problems which are associated with uh, this top and weight type of flow, uh, uh, flow control or ARQ algorithm. Uh, in stop and wait ARQ, first of all every packet needs to wait for the acknowledgement of the previous packet. So, until you are receiving the acknowledgement for the previous packet, you will not be able to send the next packet. Now, for if you think about bidirectional connections, for bidirectional connection, uh, you can use two instances of stop and wait. One instances of stop and wait will uh, ensure, one instances of stop and wait will uh, ensure uh, transferring of data. Uh, from A to B and another instances of stop and wait will ensure transferring data from B to A, but uh, this will again uh, uh, result in a significant waste of uh, network resources that uh, for both the site you have to wait for the acknowledgement. So, one possible solution to solve this particular problem is that you can piggyback data and acknowledgement from both the direction, but even if you are piggybacking data and acknowledgement for both the direction. So, piggybacking here means that whenever you are sending a data frame along with the data frame, you also add sub the acknowledgement. So, this data is say this is going for sequence 1 and along with the data with sequence 1, you send the acknowledgement for uh, the previous one which is coming from B to A. So, it is like that uh, say this is B and this is A from B to A you are sending one data packet for B to A whenever you are sending a data packet say A has earlier sent a packet to B you are sending the acknowledgement uh, along with uh, whenever you are sending the data packet to A. Uh, so, although this piggybacking mechanism is uh, more efficient uh, compared to uh, compared to this uh, using these two instances of stop and wait, but still it is wasting a huge amount of resource because for all packets uh, you need to wait for the acknowledgement. So, you will not be able to parallelly transmit the packets in the network. Uh, so, uh, to solve this problem uh, we use a class of flow control algorithms which we call as the sliding window protocol. So, the, the sliding window protocols are a pipeline protocol where you can send multiple frames or multiple packets all together without waiting for the corresponding acknowledgement. So, you can send multiple frames and all the frames uh, can go in a pipeline way. So, a broad idea of this uh, sliding window protocol is something like this. If you look into the stop and wait protocol, so the stop and wait protocol you are sending only one data packet. So, only one data packet is, can be outstanding in the network. So, once this data packet is received by this receiver, then this receiver sends back the ACK and once you are receiving that ACK at the sender, then only you will be able to send the next data packet. In case of my pipeline protocol or the sliding window protocol, what we do that we can send a sequence of packets and parallelly we can receive the sequence of acknowledgement. So, that way we will be able to use this pipeline concept over the network where you could be able to send a sequence of packets all together um, and parallelly you can receive a sequence of acknowledgement. So, that way you will be able to utilize the network resource more efficiently because nowadays uh, uh, now um, uh, with this particular approach of sliding window protocol you will be ensuring that uh, more number of packets can be pushed to the network if the network has that much of capacity and uh, parallelly you will be able to receive the acknowledgement and you will be able to adjust your transmission rate accordingly so that uh, you can receive the packets correctly at the uh, other end. So, this is the broad idea of the sliding window protocol and uh, in the next class we will look into this sliding window protocols in details. So, thank you all for attending the class.